The usual advice for avoiding heart disease is to eat a low-fat diet with plenty of whole grains and substitute vegetable oils for saturated animal fats. But does that advice really fit with human biology? Let's start with one simple idea. Mother Nature isn't stupid. She didn't make human beings the only species on Earth who prefers foods that will kill us. So what do human beings naturally like to eat? Your natural preference is for things that are salty, things that are sweet, and things that are fatty. Um, you have those three native desires for good reason. Those are the things that are good for you. That's where the nutrients that you need are located. In nature, sweet means fruit, along with certain vegetables like carrots, and those are good for you. Fats occur naturally in foods like olives and nuts, but for most of human history, the biggest source of fat was saturated animal fat, which is fatty and salty. Yum, yum. And for millions of years, this is exactly how we ate. We ate no sugar, almost no starch, a little bit of vegetable fat, and a whole lot of saturated animal fat, up to five or even ten times as much as the experts say we should. But almost nobody got heart disease. If you look at pre-agricultural humans, at their skeletal remains, the cortical thickness of their bones, they're robust, they're tall, they had good teeth. When societies became agricultural and we became short of stature, you know, tooth decay became rampant, infections were rampant, uh, human health devolved when we adopted agriculture. If you could pack all of human history into one year, we've only been farming and eating grain since about yesterday, which is when we became shorter and fatter. We only started consuming processed vegetable oils about 10 minutes ago, which is when heart disease became our number one killer. So after examining all this human history, the experts came to the obvious conclusion. We need to eat a lot more of these. And so they convinced us that human health depends on foods we didn't eat for more than 99% of our entire existence. How did this happen? In the 1950s, a biochemist named Ansel Keys published a study that compared heart disease and fat consumption in a half dozen countries. The more fat, the more heart disease. The trend line was unmistakable. Just one little problem. Keys left out countries where people eat a lot of fat but have very little heart disease, like Holland and Norway. He also left out countries where people don't eat much fat but do have a lot of heart disease, like Chile. In fact, Keyes had reliable data from 22 countries, and the results were all over the place. But you can't make a big splash in the scientific community with a trend line that looks like this. So Keyes did what any dedicated researcher would do. He threw out the data that didn't fit and published his results. His punishment for this bit of scientific chicanery was to get his picture on the cover of Time magazine. Keyes became known as the father of the lipid hypothesis, which says that eating saturated fat raises the cholesterol in your blood, and high cholesterol in your blood clogs your arteries and causes heart disease. The hypothesis that when you eat high fat, that then that produces high cholesterol, and the cholesterol produces heart disease, is wrong in every one of those links. This whole idea that dietary fat causes cholesterol problems is sort of a myth. The whole idea that uh, cholesterol problems lead to heart disease is a myth. The theory is completely and totally wrong. It was uh, a theory that was made out of whole cloth and then pushed. The, the term artery clogging saturated fat, it's as though it's all one word. It's become part of the the zeitgeist, everybody knows saturated fat is bad for you, but when you get back and you start looking at the medical literature and you root back through to find out where this whole idea came from, it's bogus. Three authors who did root through the medical literature are science writer Gary Taubes, Swedish doctor Ufi Ravenskov, and British doctor Malcolm Kendrick. When they examined the data from all the big studies on heart disease, they discovered some pretty interesting facts. Here's my favorite. Guess how many studies actually prove that a high-fat diet causes heart disease? The answer? Zero. That's right. None. In some of the largest studies ever conducted, researchers put thousands of volunteers on a low-fat diet and then tracked their health history for several years. 
The results? Nothing. They had just as many heart attacks as people who weren't on a low-fat diet. Since 1948, the Harvard Medical School has been following the diets and death rates of the entire population of Framingham, Massachusetts. One of the researchers involved in the Framingham study called the lipid hypothesis the greatest scientific scam of this century, perhaps of any century. And after more than 40 years, even the director of the study made a rather startling admission about what the study data actually shows. The more saturated fat one ate, the more cholesterol one ate, the lower the person's serum cholesterol. In other words, a high-fat diet does not automatically raise your cholesterol. Well, what about the second half of the lipid hypothesis? Whether it comes from your diet or not, doesn't high cholesterol cause heart disease? After all, that's what the experts have been telling us for 50 years. Lots of people have bad heart attacks and have low cholesterol. There's not really a huge correlation there. You've got people who have heart attacks and who develop plaque who have high cholesterol, people who have low cholesterol. There's really not any correlation. Michael DeBakey, the famous heart surgeon, compared the medical records of more than 1,700 of his own patients. He found no relationship between cholesterol levels and heart disease. When Dwight Eisenhower had his first heart attack, his cholesterol was only about 165. Wow, that's a nice healthy level there, General. So if high cholesterol doesn't actually cause heart disease, what does? The newest theories in heart disease development don't have anything to do with cholesterol. They have to do with inflammation. Cholesterol does not cause heart disease. Cholesterol is the thing that heart disease acts upon. The, the heart disease is the inflammation and the oxidation, the placking out of cholesterol once it becomes uh, oxidized. So many people have been found that have low uh, normal or low cholesterol and they still have bad heart disease. But uh, most of those people, when, when they're checked carefully, will have signs of, of inflammation. To understand how inflammation can cause heart disease, let's look at what cholesterol actually does. Cholesterol is one of the most important substances in your body. Without it, you'd be dead. Your brain and your nervous system are full of cholesterol. The walls of your cells depend on cholesterol. Nearly all of your hormones are made from cholesterol. This stuff is so important, almost every cell in your body can make its own cholesterol if it has to. The heart disease story we all know goes like this. If you have too much LDL or bad cholesterol, it builds up in your arteries and makes them narrow. But if you're lucky, HDL or good cholesterol gobbles it up and clears it away. It's a nice simple story. And it's a load of baloney. For one thing, LDL and HDL are not cholesterol. They're proteins that carry cholesterol through your blood. LDL carries cholesterol from your liver to your tissues, and HDL carries old cholesterol back to your liver where it's recycled. If you want more HDL, the last thing you need is a low-fat diet. What makes HDL go up? Fat in the diet. That's what raises HDL. So you increase the fat in your diet, and your HDL, deemed by even the most fervent anti-cholesterol person as the good cholesterol, HDL goes up. That's right. In spite of what the experts told us, 27 different studies have shown that eating saturated fat raises your HDL. And despite its bad reputation, not all LDL is actually bad. LDL comes in different size packages. They're little small, dense, BB-like packages, and they're big, round, fluffy, cotton ball-like packages. And the small, dense ones, it turns out, what's called a type B uh, LDL, are the most harmful ones. And the big, fluffy ones aren't particularly harmful at all. Heart disease doesn't begin when your cholesterol goes up. It begins when your arteries become damaged or inflamed. LDL then does exactly what it's supposed to do. It brings in cholesterol to help the healing process. But if small LDL becomes damaged by oxidation, it can penetrate the wall of the artery. If the inflammation and oxidation continue, a plaque begins to form. Now you've got heart disease. So does a high-fat diet produce too much small LDL? Nope. Small LDL is the result of eating too many carbohydrates. That's 
been shown in the medical literature probably a dozen times at least in papers that reducing carbohydrate in the diet shifts from a small dense pattern to a big fluffy pattern. Having an LDL that's 120 or 130 or 100 or 145 doesn't matter as much as the kind of LDL that it is. If the numbers alone don't mean very much, then why does high cholesterol get all the blame? Research consistently shows that smoking, elevated blood sugar, and emotional stress can cause inflammation, damage your arteries, and lead to heart disease. They also happen to raise your cholesterol. So by blaming cholesterol for causing heart disease, the experts relied on logic that makes about as much sense as this. In high crime areas, there are more calls to the police. Therefore, we can assume that calling the police produces an increase in crime. To get rid of crime, the answer is simple. Stop calling the police. But in spite of all the evidence that cholesterol is just an innocent bystander, the experts keep trying to bring it up on charges. In 1988, the Surgeon General's office set out to prove the lipid hypothesis by reviewing the data from all the major studies. But after 11 years and more than $100 million, the results were not supporting the theory. So they did what any dedicated government researchers would do. They shut down the entire project, saying it was becoming too complicated. And as Kendrick Taubes and Ravenskov discovered, that's been a disturbingly common pattern. Researchers routinely ignore evidence that the lipid hypothesis is wrong and sometimes even manipulate their data for the sole purpose of supporting it. What could possibly cause such rampant dishonesty? In the 1970s, the lipid hypothesis was still very much in dispute. Then a Senate committee headed by George McGovern decided to settle the issue. McGovern at the time was following the Pritikin diet and believed everyone should be cutting back on fat and cholesterol. The committee's original report urged Americans to reduce their risk of heart attacks by reducing their intake of cholesterol, down to the equivalent of about one egg a day. But doctors took issue with that at the hearing, saying that eight studies involving 5,000 patients failed to show hard medical evidence that diet has anything to do with heart attacks. Hmm, let's listen to that part again. Eight studies involving 5,000 patients failed to show hard medical evidence that diet has anything to do with heart attacks. I have pleaded in my report and will plead again orally here for more research on the problem before we make announcements to the American public. You know, there were eminent scientists of the time saying, this is nonsense. There is no good scientific evidence that either fat or cholesterol, you know, is at the root of heart disease. I said to the professor that I was working with, you know, this is not right. Animal fat's not causing this, and this is not what the data says. So the McGovern staff did what any dedicated staff working for McGovern would do. They decided those scientists must have been paid off by the big bad dairy and egg industries. Well, I, I would only argue that senators don't have the luxury that a research scientist does awaiting until every last shred of uh, evidence is in. They went to great lengths to overlook anything that did not fall into lockstep with that belief and basically just unleashed what amounted to a, a several decade long experiment in which all of us were unwitting participants. The McGovern Committee's report was written by a young staff member who happened to be a vegetarian and had no background in medicine or health research. The committee recommended a low-fat, low-cholesterol diet for everyone and offered some ideas that could only spring from the mind of a politician. But Senator Schweiker of Pennsylvania suggested that instead of discrediting the committee's report, the egg men should be out developing hens that would lay low-cholesterol eggs. <laughs> Soon after the McGovern report was issued, the USDA got into the act. Carol Tucker Foreman, the assistant secretary at the time, believed in the low-fat diet theory and wanted to issue official guidelines to tell everybody how to eat. To make sure she was on solid scientific ground, she consulted with Philip Handler, the head of the National Academy of Sciences. Just one little problem. Handler told her the McGovern Committee's report was nonsense. So she did what any dedicated government official would do. She ignored him, shopped around for a scientist who agreed with her, then issued the guidelines. 
Thanks to a handful of politicians with no background in science, the heart-healthy benefits of a low-fat diet became official government policy. And real scientists got the message loud and clear. Tell us what we already believe or you can say goodbye to your lucrative government funding. There is influence that goes on, starting with the USDA, which is promoting commodity agriculture. So there is a lot of economic pressure on the people at NIH, on the people in the universities who carry out the studies for NIH. They live by their grants. No grants, no work, no job. Dr. Kilmer McCulley, a researcher at Harvard, went against the prevailing theory and published a study concluding that something other than cholesterol was causing heart disease. His reward for this bit of scientific integrity was to be denied tenure, lose all his research grants, and get shoved into a little laboratory in the basement. In academia, that's a polite way of saying, you're fired. He also ended up on an unofficial blacklist, and it took him two years to find another job as a researcher. A lot of people have built careers on this, and it's, uh, these are careers built on a very shaky factual foundation. There's a reasonable... Um, reason to believe that from the beginning, but to persist in the face of so much overwhelming evidence really can't be based on science and you have to, you have to think that there were other factors involved. Uh, it became uh, an industry. In the 1980s, the National Cholesterol Education Program released new guidelines that said everyone's cholesterol should be below 200, which was about 20 points below normal. And here's a strange coincidence. Most of the scientists who wrote those guidelines just happen to have a financial relationship with the companies that make cholesterol-lowering drugs called statins. Many of the studies that claimed a low-fat diet is good for your heart were funded by the American Heart Association, which earns millions of dollars licensing its heart check logo to healthy low-fat foods like Cocoa Puffs. If the lipid hypothesis ever goes away, that logo just became worthless. Give this another uh, decade, and that hypothesis will be on the junk pile of history because it's not true. Okay, so maybe the lipid hypothesis isn't true. So what? What could possibly be wrong with cutting back on saturated fat and getting your cholesterol as low as possible? We now have this terrible phobia of fat, of animal fat, which the body needs to be normal, to be healthy. Your immune system is fat dependent. I mean, your brain is fat dependent. Your skin, your hair, your nails, all these things are fat dependent. Your, your sex hormones are fat dependent, are cholesterol dependent. They're made sort of on a cholesterol molecule. If you are elderly over the age of 60, and if you're a woman of any age, the cholesterol is a complete non issue. In fact, the higher your cholesterol, the longer you live. And this is, shows up in study after study. And yet, in spite of those studies, drugs that lower cholesterol are being marketed to women. But take a good look at that little disclaimer. If it doesn't prevent heart disease, why on earth would you take such a powerful drug? There is absolutely no benefit for women of any age in taking statins. I mean, statins are a waste of money for women. There's some real problems with taking statins. Memory loss, muscle problems, and osteoporosis in women. I mean, there are a lot of reasons that you wouldn't want to take statin drugs. And low cholesterol is a predictor for depression, suicide, violent behavior, strokes, and cancer. It's much better to have high cholesterol than lower cholesterol. Like most people, I love the taste of fat. Human beings can't live without protein, and in nature, protein is usually surrounded with fat. Maybe Mother Nature actually knew what she was doing. Maybe there's a reason low-fat diets always made me feel depressed. The brain is basically made of fat. They say you're a fat head, they were not kidding. And when you go on a diet that eliminates most fat, takes you down to say 10% of fat, you have, have basically robbed the body of the raw materials that are necessary for it to be happy. Uh, there's probably no, uh, uh, no coincidence that back a couple of decades ago when the low-fat diet was the real rage, if you went to bookstores, what you saw is all these books on low-fat diet and you saw all these books on depression because everybody was depressed. When I load up on proteins and animal fats, I don't feel hungry and I do feel good. So on this diet, I'm ignoring the experts. Look at all that saturated fat.
my Passover dinner. Jack in the box. It's like the discovery. Sourdough chicken sandwich. Here's the good thing about being middle-aged. Do I know these sunglasses look ridiculous? Yes. Do I care? No. My two-year-old didn't feel like sleeping last night, so I had to get up with her a few times, and I ended up sleeping in too late to get breakfast. That's the bad news. The good news is it's gonna be a big lunch. A bacon ultimate cheeseburger and a diet soda, please. Medium diet Coke, make that. Bacon ultimate and a medium That's right. Go on a shopping trip at your local natural food store and you'll find the shelves jam-packed with processed vegetable oils. But what exactly is natural about them? Would human beings living in the wild ever consume oils that came from soybeans or corn? We've never had these in the human diet in the history of the world. Where do you get fat from corn? If you take corn and put it in a thing and squeeze it, you don't get corn fat out of it. You don't get corn oil. You've got to chemically extract the oil from corn to get it. Until that process was developed, you didn't have all of these vegetable, soybean oil and corn oil and cottonseed oil and all these things. Humans didn't eat that stuff. The studies that came in on the corn oil showed that it was a disaster, that it caused cancer. If you gave carcinogens to rats who were fed corn oil, they developed cancer. If the rats were fed coconut oil or tallow, they didn't get cancer. And it's not just cancer. After the experts convinced millions of Americans to switch from butter and lard to margarine and vegetable oils, heart disease went up. How can that be? After all, vegetable oils are cholesterol-free. We as humans are not used to eating those fats in the quantities that we've been eating them. I mean, uh, that's what's called an omega-6 fat. Omega-6 fats are pro-inflammatory. They cause inflammation. We need some of them, but we don't need a whole lot of them. But we do eat a whole lot of them, and those unnatural fats can cause the inflammation that leads to heart disease, especially the most unnatural fat of all partially hydrogenated vegetable oils, otherwise known as trans fats. It gives you the cooking properties you need, the flakiness in biscuits and the chewiness in bread and the things that you look for from a saturated fat. But it doesn't behave as a saturated fat in the body, and the body actually will take it up very readily and pack it into the cell membranes, which then become stiff and inflexible and can't do their job. The Center for Science in the Public Interest recently filed a lawsuit against KFC for using trans fats to fry chicken. And pretty much everyone agrees that trans fats are bad news. So why do the restaurants even use them? The old McDonald's french fries, for example, were cooked in, in beef tallow, which is a saturated fat that's got lots of stearic acid in it. Stearic acid is a, is a long-chain saturated fat that's been shown to actually either lower or have no effect on cholesterol. It's a pretty innocuous fat. They had very well publicized, very carefully orchestrated protests outside of McDonald's and the other fast food chains. Took out petitions and, and went after them. And they made them change. And what they made them change to, of course, was partially hydrogenated vegetable fat. And he came up with one of his papers which said trans fatty acids not guilty as charged and distributed all of this. Here is the head of the CSPI. And they're still in their journals. In other words, all you have to do is go take a look at it. And they said, trans fatty acids, not guilty as charged. So their big jihad to get rid of saturated fat ended up making everybody switch to trans fat. Somebody evidently said to them, you're wrong, there's something wrong with the uh, trans fatty acids. And they didn't about face. Now, the same group, the CSPI, is going after people for using trans fats. And the, they're only using the trans fats because they went after them for using the saturated fats in the first place. And they lied. And they said, oh, we've been telling you all along that the trans fatty acids were a problem. 
and they, they just simply lied. Apparently, believing that people were basing their diets on $10 buckets of movie popcorn, CSPI scared people away from a perfectly natural, healthy fat. The study found 70% of all theaters tested still popping with high-fat coconut oil. The scare was invented by Center for Science and the Public Interest, who, by their own admission, was being supported by the soy industry. It's a saturated fat, but it's a, it's a good kind of saturated fat. It's got lauric acid in it, which is a good sort of immune-enhancing saturated fat. I mean, there's nothing in the world wrong with coconut oil. They wanted the movie theaters to use partially hydrogenated soybean oil instead of coconut oil. And what does it get replaced with? Trans fats that are much worse. Thanks to the experts, the politicians, and the radical vegetarian nutcases, we've been scared away from perfectly natural animal fats that kept us healthy for millions of years. We scared men away from saturated fat, which helps to produce testosterone, and now we take Viagra. We scared parents into giving their kids skim milk while their brains are growing, and now we've got kids who can't concentrate and take drugs for ADD. And worse, the experts convinced us to switch to highly processed and completely unnatural fats that cause inflammation, weaken our cells, and make us sick. This was all being pr uh, pushed and advocated by people that Americans trusted, by our government, by people wearing white coats, scientists and doctors. And they were wrong. They were simply wrong and we are reaping the whirlwind of the consequences today. What are you doing? Well, I thought people would want to hear the details on exactly how this diet is affecting our sex life. I was kind of hoping you could talk about that. Are you a moron? <laughs> The rise in heart disease, and especially the rise in obesity and diabetes, is very clearly about one thing. It's about carbohydrate. That's the big problem that all the, these uh, low-fat people have had with, uh, with a low-fat diet, because a low-fat diet is a high-carbohydrate diet, okay? I mean, because you've got to eat something, and fat and carbohydrate are kind of inversely proportional. When one goes down, the other goes up. Which is exactly what the experts told us to do. The USDA food pyramid recommends a low-fat diet that includes up to 11 servings per day of grains. To be based on grains is not the native diet for, for any uh, mammal. There's only one group of animals that lives well on grains, and that's birds. You know, the USDA food pyramid is, is more about selling agricultural products than it is about selling health. They are totally committed to what can be sold in the commodity markets. So that's wheat, corn, soybeans, sugar. A few years ago I went back and pulled some labels off of feed sacks in a farmer's co-op and ran them through my little nutritional computer. I and mean, there's virtually no difference in the macronutrient composition that farmers use to feed animals to fatten them up and that the USDA uses to tell us how to supposedly slim down. In the 1990s, the Food and Drug Administration decided it was time to help us slim down. So they ordered food manufacturers to adopt a standardized nutrition label that includes recommended servings of protein, carbohydrates, and fat. FDA Commissioner David Kessler said it was the most important battle for public health he'd ever waged. Stories in the media were full of happy predictions about how much smarter Americans were going to eat, thanks to all that good government advice. And since then... Well, maybe we're not following those guidelines. Or maybe we are. The nutrition label the FDA made everybody adopt recommends 300 carbohydrates per day on a 2,000 calorie diet. If you ate four cups of broccoli, three cups of spinach, two cups of peas, five carrots, and two apples, you would consume about 100 grams of carbohydrate. 
So how do you get to 300? It would take a lot of cauliflower and broccoli and cabbage and those kind of things to ever get you to 300 grams of carbohydrate. You can do it with starch. You can do it with, uh, you know, with potatoes, which are basically a pure starch. You can do it without a whole lot of, of corn or rice, but those are really starchy foods. And the starch in those breaks down in the GI tract basically to sugar. The speed at which a particular food raises your blood sugar is measured by something known as the glycemic index. Table sugar has a glycemic index of 64. Coca-Cola has a glycemic index of 63. The foods we ate for millions of years almost all had a low glycemic index. So what about all those whole grains the experts tell us should be the foundation of a healthy human diet? Raisin Bran has a glycemic index of 61. Shredded wheat logs in at 67, which means it spikes your blood sugar faster than sugar does. And depending on the brand, whole wheat bread raises the bar to around 70. Sugar. So whether they intended to or not, the FDA and USDA are telling you to load up on sugar. And lots of it. The amount of blood sugar in your blood, if you have a normal blood sugar, is a little bit less than one teaspoon. 300 grams of carb that comes as potato or pasta, even if it's whole grain pasta or whole grain bread, that converts to a cup and a half of sugar. If you were to put a cup and a half of sugar directly into your blood, you'd be dead. Your blood sugar would go sky high. Since high blood sugar can kill you, your body has to bring it down. And that's how metabolic syndrome begins. Most of us think we only put fat in our fat cells when we eat too much. But as Gary Taubes explains in Good Calories, Bad Calories, your fat cells are like rechargeable fuel cells. Every time you eat, you store some fat. In between meals, fat comes out of your fat cells to provide the fuel for your muscles and organs. If you're naturally thin, it's because you have efficient fat cells. Fat goes in quickly and it comes out easily. Your body doesn't need much fat because the little bit of fat you do have is a reliable source of fuel. If you're predisposed to be fat, it's because you have greedy fat cells. When you eat, you tend to store calories as fat instead of burning them. And when your other tissues need those calories, the fat comes out slowly if it comes out at all. What are they doing? Did one of you guys forget to pay the food bill? Boom. Are you going to eat all that? The end user of food that we eat our individual cells. And it doesn't matter if it goes in our mouth. Boom. If it doesn't get to those cells, we starve. We starve at the cellular level. And so you do exactly what your body is telling you to do. Come on, eat, eat something. Eat steak, will ya? You eat more. In other words, you're not getting fat because you're eating more. You're eating more because you're getting fat. Remember, Mother Nature isn't stupid. If your fat cells are slow to release their fuel, your body actually works to make them bigger. And they keep on getting bigger until they can release the energy that your body needs. Oh, oh, oh. That could mean gaining a little weight, or it could mean gaining a lot. It all depends on how slowly your fat cells release their fat. Most of us weren't born with greedy fat cells, but we can certainly make them that way. When you eat too many carbohydrates, you raise your blood sugar. Since high blood sugar is toxic, your body releases insulin to bring it down. But your body can only burn a little bit of sugar at a time. So what happens to the rest of it? Your storage sites for carbohydrate are limited, and we've got unlimited storage places for fat, so the body ends up just converting the carbohydrate to fat. And after bringing down your blood sugar, insulin does its other job. It tells your body to store fat. Insulin stimulates an enzyme called lipoprotein lipase that sends fat into the fat cell. So if insulin is elevated, this lipoprotein lipase is really activated and it's sending fat like crazy into the fat cell. So if you eat a lot of carbohydrates, your insulin goes up, you're storing fat in the fat cell. When you have a healthy metabolism, it only takes a little bit of insulin to bring your blood sugar down, and then everything goes back to normal. But over time, boom, boom. that can change. The cells can become resistant to the effects of insulin. In essence, when that happens, insulin's talking, but the cells just aren't listening. And so they don't get the message from insulin, so they don't do what they're supposed to do. Hello? Stop hitting me. I'm not hitting you. Stop hitting me. I'm not hitting you. 
And so your body does what it has to do. It starts producing more insulin. You finally reach the point to where your insulin's high just to keep your sugar normal, even if you're not eating any sugar. And then when that happens, then it's starting to drive stuff into the fat cell, and then you've reached this point where all of a sudden, bam, you get fat. And you get fat even though you're eating the same number of calories you always did, because now you have greedy fat cells. So you do what the experts have always told us to do. You go on a low-fat, low-calorie diet so you can burn your own body fat for fuel. Just one little problem. If too many carbohydrates are keeping your insulin high, the insulin is telling your body to store the fat instead of burning it. Now you're really starving inside. You're doing all that you're yourself. Going Come on, you big pig. What do you think you're doing? What's you know, the matter with you? I need to you know. So once again, your body does what it has to do. It slows down your metabolism. You stop losing weight. You get tired, and then you do things like drive around the parking lot looking for a close parking space. So, you know, so many of my patients come in following that advice where they say, well, I know it can't be about my diet because I'm eating a good diet. And I say, well, what did you have for breakfast this morning? And they say, well, I ate a bowl of Special K, um, and I used low-fat milk, and then I had uh, two pieces of whole wheat toast. And to break your fast in the morning, with all of that insulin-producing high glycemic diet, it's going to shut down your metabolism and is the prescription for making you fat. And then they end up being, in most cases, larger than they were when they started out, but with a lower metabolic rate. And it frustrates so many people because they do it and they fail, and then they think they failed. And they didn't fail. The diet failed. The next time you feel like indulging in the usual prejudice against fat people, here's something to keep in mind. My wife has always been thin, and she's the first to admit it has nothing to do with discipline. When she and I sit down for a meal, we both do exactly the same thing. We eat until we're not hungry anymore. I got fat and stayed fat because I was living on foods that told my body to store the calories in my fat cells, which just made me hungrier. In some people, the fat cells and the other tissues become insulin resistant at about the same rate. The good news is they don't gain weight. The bad news is insulin resistance can kill you even if you're skinny. Demanding of your pancreas that it produce ever greater amounts of insulin to keep your blood sugar normal is ultimately going to cause what's called beta cell burnout. Finally, the, the pancreas is producing all it can produce, and that's not enough anymore. And when that happens, the beta cells get damaged, they can't produce anymore, and your blood sugar goes up, and now you've become, frankly, diabetic. And once your blood sugar goes out of control, it can damage your arteries and lead to heart disease. And yet, the experts keep telling us to stay away from fat and load up on carbohydrates. On their website, CSPI encourages parents to cut the fat from their kids' diets and feed them starchy foods like whole wheat crackers and grape nuts. Grape nuts have a glycemic index of 64, Sugar. which make them more fattening. If you were to eat a bowl of grape nuts, the calories are about the same as eating an extra large Snickers bar. Sugar. We were all subjects in a giant experiment the hypothesis of which was that fat is bad for us. And now here we all are at the end of this giant experiment. Type 2 diabetes is at a screamingly high rate. Way, way more people are overweight than used to be. Grandmother could tell you that that diet would make you fat. She knew that, that potatoes and bread were fattening. Uh, we all knew it until modern nutrition told us otherwise. Which is why I'm intentionally ignoring what modern nutrition says. I'm eating lots of protein and plenty of fat, but I'm limiting my carbohydrates to about 100 grams per day. Because my doctor was going on vacation, I shortened my 30-day diet to 28 days and went to my post-diet checkup. I showed my doctor what I'd been eating, which included 15 double or triple cheeseburgers, 19 sausage patties, 52 eggs, and a dozen servings of fried chicken. He was not exactly happy with my choices. Let's step up here and see what damage you've done. Okay, I have no idea why this is. 
You lost weight. <laughs> you lost weight. A 194, I believe, in a quarter. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you move away, I can see better. Yep. So I lost. Let me see. I think so. 12 and a quarter. What did you drink? Either Diet Coke or iced tea or water. Okay. Your total cholesterol was 231. Mm -hmm. It's now 222. Now, before you think that that's a decrement, it, uh, if I would check the same sample two and three times, we would have that kind of variance. Okay. Okay, so that, that to me, didn't change. What's that look? It's 28.2. I don't like what you're proving here. I, I didn't write it the last time, but I believe you, 31.2, which was high. Mm -hmm. And uh, you went to 28.2. And that's eating a lot of junk. Mm -hmm. So, you, I believe you've proved your point. See, but you did it with an eye towards an end, mm -hmm. okay? You had an idea what you were doing, you knew what you were doing, and in spite of that, you were able to do something. I'm impressed, and I would agree with you. There's more to it than just, you know, no fast food. Do you ever wake up in the middle of the night and go, cheeseburger, cheeseburger? Yeah, all, like every night, almost yeah. every night. You get like the shakes and withdrawals, and I start like hitting people. I've done and, that. Like, I need chicken nuggets. Now see, or... I thought I was the only one. Yeah, no, no. The part of Supersize Me that really made me laugh was not supposed to be funny. To figure out why I was laughing, let's play a game called One of These Statements is Not Like the Others. Number one, this food is so awful it makes me vomit. Number two, I think I'm getting addicted to this food. Number three, in one more day I never have to eat this crap again. If you selected number two, congratulations, you have a functioning brain. For a guy who claimed to be suffering from a McDonald's addiction, Spurlock somehow managed to quit the stuff cold turkey and go back to his girlfriend's vegan diet. After eating at McDonald's every day for 28 days, I didn't set foot in the place for three weeks. I was tired of it. If this is an addiction, it's not a very good one. So why even play that angle? Well. If you're going to let a lawyer who desperately wants to sue McDonald's serve as your technical advisor, you kind of have to play the addiction angle, don't you? And by the way, how did Spurlock do on that purifying vegan diet? But it took him four months to lose 20 of those pounds and another four and a half or, or maybe five months to lose the other four and a half or five pounds on this, you know, pristine, constructed by his vegan chef girlfriend diet. I mean, I thought that was amazing. If he'd have just gone on a low carb diet, if he'd just gone back to McDonald's and only eaten bacon double cheeseburgers without the bun, a salad, and an iced tea, he would probably have resolved his problem in three weeks. Don't get me wrong. A fast food diet is not a good diet. A good diet would include a lot more fruits and vegetables. But if I can eat fast food every meal for 28 days and lose weight, then most people can certainly eat fast food a few times a week without becoming obese. I was happy to lose the 12 pounds, but I wasn't quite finished with diets. While researching this film, I was surprised to learn that the lipid hypothesis might be a load of baloney. So with a little encouragement from Dr. Eads, I decided to conduct a one-man experiment. For a solid month, I cut all the sugar and starch out of my diet, and I went on a saturated fat pig out. For breakfast, I ate two or three eggs fried in butter every day with plenty of bacon. When I was traveling, I ate sausage McMuffins without the muffins. For lunch, I had cheeseburgers without buns covered with plenty of onions fried in, you guessed it, coconut oil. For dinner, I had nicely marbled steaks or Polish sausages. My favorite snack was shredded cheese fried in coconut oil. I also ate plenty of fruit covered with heavy cream and lots of green vegetables practically swimming in butter. 
During that same month, I had a big programming project with a tight deadline, so I spent a lot of nights working until 2 in the morning. But I never felt exhausted. In fact, my energy and my mood were great. At the end of that month, I had yet another cholesterol test. The results? Well, let's just say somebody has some explaining to do. My overall cholesterol dropped and my HDL shot up. The experts who think cholesterol is important tell us to watch our cholesterol ratio, which is calculated by dividing your total cholesterol by your HDL. After a solid month of eating everything the experts say is bad for your heart, my cholesterol ratio dropped to 3.27. According to the experts, that's outstanding. When I think of all the times I had low-fat cereal when I really wanted bacon and eggs or a skinless chicken breast when I really wanted a juicy steak, well, it kind of pisses me off. So, let's review. Who told Americans to avoid saturated fats which make you feel full and happy and don't spike your blood sugar and told us instead to eat lots and lots of carbohydrates which do spike your blood sugar and make you hungry again soon after eating them? Your government. Who cut funding for PE programs and, even according to John Banzaff, doesn't provide enough playgrounds in many areas? Your government. Who ordered kids to ride a school bus across town instead of letting them walk to their neighborhood school? Your government. Who pushed trans fats into the fast food restaurants right around the time more Americans were eating fast food? The guy from CSPI. So who does Morgan Spurlock blame for America's growing waistline? Ronald McDonald. And who do the food evangelists want to swoop in and solve this problem? Your government. That reminds me of the only saving grace of government is that they're incompetent because if they could do what they really wanted, it would be horrible for all of us. And now for the one question that really matters. Who decides to drink 44-ounce sodas and eat big bowls of sugary cereal and large orders of fries and then go home and sit in front of the TV and eat more sugar and more starch instead of taking up a sport or just going for a long walk? You do. And if that's your choice... So it is, and I think for the most part, a very sincere blindness to the possibility that other people might just have different values and preferences than they do. I love hamburgers. I love french fries. I love Coke. I, I love to go in there. And you know, there are times when I eat these meals, even though I know that this is not the healthiest food for me to be eating. And that in a free society, that's OK. You know, it's all right. Well, I'm lysine, bromide, various insecticides, blue dye number nine. I'm 20 different acids and 13 alkalines. I'm dextrose, glycerated, saccharin, monosodium, glutamate, and a couple grams of oat bran iron, just by mistake. So put me in a beaker and better run some tests on me. With the toxins in my body, I'm a walking pharmacy. I'm shopping for my coffin, but don't shed me any tears. Cause according to the experts, I've been dead for several years. Now I'm probably just a victim of my weak heredity. My grandpa loved his whiskey, cigarettes, and ham and cheese. He had bacon, eggs, and coffee every day he was alive. And his diet finally killed him at the age of 95. So put me in a beaker and better run some tests on me. With the toxins in my body, I'm a walking pharmacy. I'm shopping for my coffin, but don't shed me any tears. Cause according to the experts, I've been dead for several years. Now my health food friend was natural in his body, mind, and soul. He only ate organic foods from a natural earthen bowl. But there was botulism in that natural garden he had plowed. He died of natural causes, and his friends were very proud. You know what they said at his funeral, don't you? Boy, he sure looks natural. Now Kim Jong-il sold chemical bombs to his buddies in Iran. 
But if they shoot them at our allies, boy, we've got a secret plan. They're gonna give me a big old cigar, put me in some bomber's load. Then they'll light me up and kick me out, and they're toast when I explode. So put me in a beaker and better run some tests on me. With the toxins in my body, I'm a walking pharmacy. I'm shopping for my coffin, but don't shed me any tears. Cause according to the experts, I've been dead for several years. 